call. I was wondering, I'm going to have to get off the call at 11 o'clock because I have another call. Okay. Um, can we move PFAS up on the agenda? Well, I think we'll get to it anyway, but yeah, that, yeah, yeah we'll do that right after um, uh, Aaron English says. We'll do that. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Robert, I'll do the roll call now. Okay, do that and then we'll start. Yep. And I, let me get the microphone. So Andy Otto, Bobby Basald, Buzz, Carl Dickens, uh, Kathleen McLeod, Alex Buglisi, Ed Siri, Aaron English, Olivia Carroll, Patrick Longmire, Rachel Coleman, the, uh, I'm sorry, 9790479, Austin yeah. Griggs, Heidi Klingel, um, Matt Spohn, um, Melissa Miller, Michael Dozier, Patricio Pacheco, and Maria Lorman is on. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Now, I wanted to go over the uh, agenda very quickly. So we're going to start out with Aaron English of Biohabitats and the uh, Constructed Treatment Wetlands. We've moved the PFAS contamination update up to this uh, the next uh, agenda item, and both Matt and Alex are going to speak to that. Uh, then we'll do the uh, we'll have Mike and Efren do a quick thing on Paseo Real, uh, just an update on the treatment plant. And then um, Jennifer Lindlein will not be able to join us until 11. She's at an opening ceremony at Highlands, and so I'm planning to have her between 11 and 11 15. The meeting should con conclude about 11 15. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, with great gratitude, Erin English to talk about um, constructive treatment wetlands. Uh, she is a local, she lives in Alafria. So Erin, welcome and thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, able to hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Yes. Great. So I would like to do a screen share here if I could. And looks like host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, is that Andy? Are you able to make me the presenter for a moment here? Hopefully, we can. Ooh. Yeah. Did that work? Cool. Yes. No, it's. I see your screen. It's your screen. <laughs> oh. Okay. oh. It's Andy's. <laughs> um, you should be able to allow click on me. Yeah. Andy, yeah. yeah. if you go to stop video. There we go. Just to go to stop video and click on the little thingy on the side and you'll go. get in there. We got it. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. There we go. Okay. Let's start that. <laughs> it started it as a screenshot. There we go. Okay, let me know if you can see that full screen. It says constructed wetlands. Yes. Yep. See it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, great. We see your presentation format. You don't see the actual slide. <laughs> okay. It's we like, see the it's... slide, but we see it in the presentation format. Okay. All right. Let's see how to do that. I just want to do the basic slides here. At the very minimum, I can yeah. do just this here. Are you able to see? Is it? Yeah. It's. I have a couple screens, and it's. It's giving me a hard time about that. Let's see here. All right. So, constructed wetlands. Um, I'm gonna just make sure. Let's see if I can get rid of this stuff at the top. There we go. Okay. Great. So, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Erin English. I know a few of you, um, but I've been in Santa Fe for about 17, 18 years. I am a um, water resources engineer, and my specialty is constructed wetlands and wastewater treatment specifically. Um, I'm with Biohabitats, which is a national firm that does ecological restoration, um, regenerative design, and conservation planning. Um, Biohabitats purchased Natural Systems International. Some of you may have known NSI. It's been around for quite some years, and that's where I was working prior to being at Biohabitats. So I've had um, about 
almost 20 years now experience doing natural and living infrastructure design, primarily for wastewater treatment, water reuse, water harvesting. Um, even though I'm, I have the great honor of being based in Santa Fe, I work all over the place. And so I'm often, before COVID anyway, on the road quite a bit. So um, a lot of our work and some of what I'll show you today is, is from all over the country and internationally. Um, so I'm not going to show international projects today. So we are um, national experts on constructed wetlands. And so that's why Kathleen and Bobby and, and folks, thanks for the invitation to come and at least talk a little bit about the science and the engineering of treatment wetlands for um, municipal wastewater treatment. And I'm going to give a, a, a pretty rapid fire overview of the technology and then dig a little bit into some projects, just two, two or three examples of where this has been applied and then some thoughts that I've had about um, if this might be applicable or how you know, it might be in, in Santa Fe. So um, my contact information is here. I've got it also at the end of the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, just briefly about myself, I'm a water resources engineer. My background is in chemical engineering. And so a lot of the work I've done is Aaron, your voice is going. Your voice is breaking going. up a little. Breaking up. Okay. Yeah. How is that? Any, any better? Yeah. Okay. So I'm a chemical engineer and have spent, you know, the last 20 years melding the the engineering of like e ecology with um, process engineering around wastewater treatment. Um, constructed wetlands are a type of natural treatment facility um, that are considered to be ecologically engineered. So these are not natural systems. These are engineered systems, um, facilities that employ the ecology of natural marshes to transform waste, reduce pollutants such as nutrients and metals, while creating additional habitat, open space, and carbon sink benefits. Constructed treatment wetlands um, are fall on a spectrum <laughs> of types of wetlands that have been applied, okay? So there are natural wetlands um, that exist in nature, right? These are a little different from that. Um, there are co constructed wetlands um, that are used for uh, treatment. There are created wetlands, which are used to mitigate or replace a lost natural wetland. And there are restored wetlands, which are like re you know, restoration of original wetland size and function. So the focus of, of my work and what I think we would be talking about for Santa Fe is on the idea of the constructed wetland. Um, with that said, we have a lot of examples from nature of, of you know, the potential of wetlands that are constructed and, and beavers are one example of, you know, the first ecological engineers, right? And we've got some living here, but you know, part of this science and work came out of looking at, you know, what happens when you allow water to slow down and, and have, you know, a lot of, you know, biodiversity among the, the different types of um, benthic and plant communities and that you allow water and soil to settle and, and nutrients to cycle. So natural treatment system on, on the whole, which include constructed wetlands, have a lot of benefits, including being passive um, land-based systems that are widely scalable. They provide stacked benefits and they can manage a range of water quality um, inputs. They can be easily integrated into the landscape. In fact, that's one of their, their strongest attributes. They can serve as ecological buffers between something like a wastewater treatment plant and a river. Um, they are often used for education and demonstration purposes to teach about biodiversity and, and wetland ecology. And they also can be used, um, and a lot of our work is, is actually providing really high performance treatment wetlands for water reuse purposes. Um, there are some challenges when integrating wetlands and natural system, natural treatment systems into projects. Um, and so one of the, ma the main things is that they have a large footprint. Okay, because biology and ecology is amazing and it can do incredible things when applied, but um, it's slow and we're not um, throwing a bunch of energy at it or a bunch of intensity um, that you might see to try to grow the bacteria and you know, create all this transformation. It's slow. Um, and so therefore the footprints are also usually larger. Um, but also there's, there's reasons why that is really beneficial too, because slow 
often provides more time for different kinds of, you know, pollutants to be managed. Um, another challenge is that these are open systems, so they are subject to rain and evaporation and storms <laughs> and animals and birds, you know, which can actually import uh, pollutants. Um, sometimes they can have some variable water quality outputs, particularly seasonal, when you get plant dieback. Um, they have some limitations with the, the types and the forms and the ability to remove both nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, they're, they're very good for denitrification. They're not so great for nitrification, for example. And with phosphorus, they're very good the first few years, and then they tend to lose their ability because they, they become saturated with phosphorus. Um, in, in another challenge and that I wanted to make sure I highlighted here is that in some locations they're undesirable because they do draw birds and being near an airport, that can be a challenge. Um, sometimes they can create an odor or mosquito challenge that can be overcome, but you know, that's a common perception and has been a problem in some places. And then they have a different kind of maintenance needed than, you know, more conventional technology. <laughs> um, it's more like a, a garden or a wild, a wildland. All of that said, however, um, there's a lot of genius in nature, right? And so Janine Benyus, who wrote Biomimicry, speaks about that idea of 3.8 billion years of research and development, failures of fossils, and what surrounds us is the secret to our survival. Um, and we know that wetlands did and do actually currently thrive here in the lower part of the Santa Fe River. So constructed wetlands, as I've mentioned a little bit here, but just to define them, they're primarily passive biological filters. Um, they're ecologically engineered and they can be configured for a number of applications, scales and climate. Um, like nature, they are astoundingly adaptable. And part of the, the magic of the treatment that happens is um, often below the surface or just at the surface um, in terms of you know, the plant roots and the beneficial bacteria who are living in collaboration or living with the plant roots and the media and the soil and whatever other else um, surfaces for attachment you have in there. But they're basically transforming waste into a food source. Um, these wetlands also provide biodiversity. Um, they can fix carbon. They can denitrify uh, ni uh, nitrate. And so that often means they're very good for agricultural waste. Or this image here on the screen is actually one we took from a photo of a large treatment wetland we have in Mexico. It's a zero moving part wastewater facility. Um, so they can provide you know, really passive, simple treatment. Um, they also, you know, become engaging pieces of education and tools for folks here. This is a modified graphic of one of ours at a water research center um, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, they, they are, are teaching tools and they can, you know, really inspire, inspire people and tie in with the STEM education. Um, there's a bunch of different types of wetlands out there. And um, in this case, most of these bigger municipal ones are going to be the surface flow style wetland. But there have been, you know, we've worked with all of these to achieve different water quality goals. Um, and, you know, something that I think when I talk to Kathleen and, and Bobby is like part of what we're looking for with the infrastructure we design, like this system here in, in New York, is that, you know, we, we have a choice of the infrastructure we build. And it's often overlooked as a place that we can really foster stewardship and, you know, this idea of regenerating the earth and regenerating humans as well. And wetlands fit really well into that. And a lot of our clients, that's what they're seeking. Um, as well, we can talk about discovering connections and this elementary school treatment wetlands, you know, getting kids connected there and having a direct experience of, of, of nature, but with an engineered, you know, water and stormwater system. Um, these are floating wetlands that we've been building in Baltimore. And so we're also working very actively with youth to grow stewardship. Um, and then to showcase solutions and to really bring people through and create something that like is a draw. Um, so I'm going to dive into some project examples here briefly, but before I do that, I just wanted to share that there's a bunch of applications for these. So I'm going to show some at the bigger municipal scale, but they've, there's been a lot of work. And so the, the technology is relatively known, but you know, a lot of different ways that these can and have been applied. Um, so a few project precedents, Probably the most famous one that's out there um, and one of the oldest is the Arcata Marsh and Wildlife Sanctuary um, up in Humboldt area in California. And um, this wetlands was built, it's a series of ponds and wetlands that were built actually to polish effluent from the city of Arcata's wastewater treatment plant, which just had very basic treatment 
and then they had oxidation ponds and then a series of wetlands and ponds, it, actually a couple of different versions of them um, as a buffer and a final treatment between you know, the wastewater treatment facilities and Humboldt Bay. And it's a pretty large footprint, but the wetlands themselves are a little smaller. And it's also a sanctuary for wildlife and visitors. Um, here it is <clears throat> kind of shown as an overview. And, um, you know, they had enough space there to be able to do something significant, and they've been studying and researching it over the, over the years. Um, this is a newer one. This is one that we built outside of Portland, Oregon in Forest Grove um, just a few years ago called the Fern Hill Natural Treatment System. And this is an ecological bridge between the treatment uh, facilities and the watershed where we're cleaning water, we're cooling water, and we're naturalizing it before it's returned to the river. Um, but most visitors have the experience of visiting a wildlife sanctuary when they come to this facility. And in fact, it has its own TripAdvisor page. And so, you know, this has a, a, a large community draw and a birder, you know, a lot of birders who want to come and, and be here. So it's an active recreation place that was built by the water utility called Clean Water Services. They're an amazing water utility. They're totally worth looking up. The kind of stuff they're doing is just spectacular. Um, they are based in a, in, a, in a watershed that's actually a cold water trout fishery. And they had these existing lagoons that were decommissioned, but kept full of water when they built an upgraded wastewater treatment plant. But they were on the red line, they were bypassing the lagoons and discharging to the river and having all sorts of temperature impacts. Um, and they had some issues with nutrients and metals. But people were coming to these lagoons, even though they weren't fancy, um, for birding. And so we came up with a plan for them to like reroute it through the lagoon and did a bunch of extensive temperature modeling because we can actually, in that part of the country anyway, cool water. <laughs> um, and so came up with this kind of uh, wetland plan um, that, that transformed those lagoons into this much more diverse um, wetland pond uh, habitat ecology. Um, and then we build it. We do design build. And so we built this, um, something like a million native plants or something installed and lots of different flow control structures to move water around. And, you know, it's been quite the birding, the birding spot as well. Um, and it's performing well. Um, and then just in closing, the last one I wanted to show, which just to demonstrate that wetlands can also be used in very high performance settings, but it's a different kind of design than the big open ponds. But um, this is a 52,000 gallon a day wastewater treatment system for the Omega Institute in upstate New York that had a bunch of failing septic systems and they wanted to build a wastewater facility, but they wanted it to be um, a visitor center and education as well. So there's a 50,000 gallon lagoon in here with floating wetlands. And then there's outdoor wetlands and sand filters, and we're hitting nitrogen levels of less than two here. Um, and the, their decision was really based on uh, make, helping people make that connection with water um, and water as the primary essence of life and showing, you know, a way that that can be managed. Um, it's really beautiful. They get 100,000 something visitors through there in a year. But, you know, it's a little different. You can see we've got gravel-based wetlands and we're doing a little more recirculation, and some active aeration. So it's possible to adapt these, um, you know, for different uh, conditions. So um, just in closing, I, I've been thinking a little bit about, you know, if this is a type of technology that could be applicable for us here in Santa Fe. Um, and questions I have are, you know, do we have the space and for either all of the effluent or maybe a portion of it, um, land availability, land ownership, favorable hydraulic gradient can be limitations. Um, and attracting birds might be just undesirable for the airport. Um, can wetlands actually meet the water quality challenges that are being experienced down at the treatment plant? Um, because as I mentioned, like they're good at transforming some forms of nitrogen and not necessarily others. Same thing with phosphorus, it's like understanding how and you know, we would adapt this technology to meet the specific challenges there. Um, from a water balance perspective, uh, wetlands both, oh, you know, they evapotranspirate water and they collect rain and stormwater, but you know, there could be some impact to hydraulics and water, right, water rights and um, maybe even groundwater recharge considerations. 
But, you know, I also think probably the biggest potential is like linking wetlands with other community benefits, uh, such as recreation or birding, sustainability education, a carbon sink for the city. Um, those are all things that could be positive attributes. So with that, I'll finish up and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Erin. This is really, really informative. Pretty neat stuff out there. I mean, one of my dreams has always been if we could manage that area and create a park, you know, a place where people could walk through and see some of the things that you're talking about. Obviously, there are a host of, of challenges and things that we need to, to be concerned about. Does freezing impact uh, the processes? Yeah, I mean, cold temperatures do impact any ecological process, including what's already happening out there at the wastewater plant. Um, but freezing itself, if we're, you're not likely going to get a freezing here. <laughs> um, but treatment wetlands have, they actually do well if they can get a, a blanket of snow or some ice cover because that actually insulates them. Um, I don't think it's cold enough here and you'd have enough water moving that it, I doubt you'd get a lot of freezing. But yeah, a little icing or snowing over actually helps. Um, that said, all of these treatment wetlands are typically designed based on cold wintertime conditions. So um, you're looking at, you know, sizing them at least preliminarily from the wintertime perspective, and they tend to then do better in the summertime. Um, yeah, I've got a host of questions. Um, where do you get your funding from? Biohacks is a... Yeah, we're a consulting firm, so we're typically not on the funding end, but um, like Fernhill here, this project that's on the screen, um, that was funded by a, a public utility, uh, the water and wastewater utility for Forest Grove, Oregon. And I think they had a mixture of, of um, you know, I don't know specifically, they've done a number of different treatment wetland projects and some pilots, so they've had a little bit of research funding, and then I think, you know, uh, utility fee funding and then likely some other um, state grants, I guess, or state loans. So, good question. Yeah. Rob, the, the issue that we have below the wastewater treatment plant is what, what I think uh, Alex has, has uh, termed, it, we have a nutrient sump. And so it's just this, it's just full of nutrients. So we're, whatever they do with the, with the water, the wastewater treatment plant, after it goes through the uh, wetlands it is filled with nutrients that we really should would prefer not to have in the water so um that's the issue that we have now to reconstruct this seems like a, a an incredible challenge um and should do you have any like a general cost of something uh, like a something we can uh, get our heads around in terms of what this might cost in offhand, no, because I don't okay. know the specific water quality challenges, the land availability, the flows. Um, and, you know, one of the big things with wetlands is land cost. So, you know, cost per acre land, land purchase can sometimes be on the significant side if it's not already, you know, owned by the utility or owned by the entity. Um, so offhand, no, but you know, there are a number of published reports out there by the US EPA and by others that do look at like, okay, approximate cost per acre. Um, so I could get that, but I, I honestly don't know the specifics of like what we would need to target here in Santa Fe. And I don't fully understand the sump concept. I've heard that floated around a little bit. And I'm guessing that there's just been some accumulation there of perhaps phosphorus and other things that are cycling. Well, in terms of land acquisition below the wastewater treatment plant, it is city land all the way to Kaya Debra. And after that, it becomes county land and then it's BLM. So it's all public land. And so there's not, a, a, I don't think there would be the need for a private land acquisition. It's just a matter of getting those uh, government agencies to agree to, to participate or be part of it. So that's helpful. Um, now, what happens with the contaminants? Now, we, if, 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 do you have to remove them periodically or they process completely? Yeah. So um, that's a good question. And, and um, at this kind of scale, you're not likely going to be doing a lot of removing. <laughs> but what happens are, there's a few things that happen. So one, we're transforming nitrogen typically through 
plant biomass, bacteria biomass, and then turning it ideally into nitrogen gas. So it's generally leaving um, and or bound up in the plants, which does do a little bit of cycling through. Um, and same thing with algae. So we can sometimes see some nitrogen spikes when we get dieback as plants in the fall. That's one of the downsides. Um, phosphorus tends to be bound up pretty well in these systems until those sites for phosphorus fill. And so typically, you know, you'll get good phosphorus performance and you don't remove it, but it, it just, it, de it declines over time. Um, and then metals and contaminants of, so, so metals, I'll address that one. So typically speaking, you know, a mixed municipal system like Santa Fe is going to have some metals in it. Um, and, you know, I, you know, these systems can remove and bind up those metals pretty well, but you're not harvesting those um, unless it's like there are, there are some wetlands that are used for industrial sites that actually you do harvest and you're removing for that. But in municipal wastewater, it's pretty low. Um, and there's been some studies to make sure that like there's not an issue for animals and bioaccumulation, right? Birds who are coming or other animals. Um, they haven't found a whole lot of evidence for concern there, but um, yeah, the metals are persistent. They don't break down, right? Um, and then the last piece is that there's, there is a fair body of work showing that treatment wetlands are very good at managing contaminants of emerging concern, like ph pharmaceuticals um, and hormones and, you know, drugs, basically, that people are taking um, estrogens that are getting into the water, wastewater source, and then often passing through the wastewater treatment plants because they were never designed for emergent, you know, contaminants like that. But wetlands, because they're slow and boggy and, you know, they, they have a fair amount of time to transform those into much less harmful or completely, you know, undetectable um, carbon chains. So, th th yeah, I, th I think overall for a municipal system, you're not doing a lot of harvesting. Um, that said, Clean Water Services that has Fernhill upstream of the treatment wetlands, they are doing um, some harvesting of the phosphorus in the stream to make struvite, which is a um, fertilizer product. And so they're actually pulling their phosphorus stream off to create struvite. Um, and phosphorus is a limited element. You know, we, we mine it. And so wastewater systems become a potential source for that um, to get it back out. So it's easier to do it in that kind of controlled process than trying to pull it out of a wetland. Aaron, this is Pat. So with the phosphorus as phosphate, you could, if you had enough calcium, you could precipitate out um, calcium phosphate phases that are have a really low solubility. But um, I don't know what the, um, you know, the redox conditions, these wetlands are reducing. So you have a lot of organic carbon. But um, yeah. I don't know if, if people have looked into that. So we're, because once you precipitate out a phosphate mineral, usually at pH is between six and eight, they're fairly insoluble. Yeah, and we, find, we, we, we see that, but in terms of trying to recover them from a wetland, I don't, I don't think they're super right. recoverable because they're bound up in the sediments right. typically. So, yeah. yeah. So if I could chime in here, part of the reason uh, the wetlands that are below the wastewater treatment plant were never built as constructed wetlands. They were, they were planted mm -hmm. as wetlands and they're doing what wetlands do. They remove nitrogen and phosphorus, but the, the plants there are never being harvested. The nitrogen and phosphorus is never being removed from the system. In fact, it's, it's incorporated in the biomass and that biomass dies mm -hmm. off and we just add more and more. So some sampling yeah. that was done during a study to look at the treatment plant's capacity to remove nitrogen and phosphorus um, actually showed that regardless of the level that we were putting out above the, the wetlands, that as it went through the wetlands, it was picking up nitrogen and phosphorus. The other situation- <laughs> Increasing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. In, in New uh -huh. Mexico, we're also, we're also being limited for total nitrogen and total phosphorus, unlike many states, uh -huh where it's dissolved, mm -hmm. dissolved nitrogen and dissolved phosphorus. And we're, mm -hmm. we're being compelled to meet some pretty stringent standards like one and 0.1, nitrogen mm -hmm. one and 0.1 or below actually on phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And yep. so I don't know what the capacity of a t constructed wetland is to do that, given our current uh, levels in the effluent. 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it could reduce it and help polish it, but I'm not sure it could ever get down to 0 0.01 on phosphorus without chemical precipitation prior. Yeah, to no, yeah, no. And I, we wouldn't propose that it could because it, it doesn't, it, like I had mentioned, there's some that seasonal cycling that you pointed out can be concerning. And then they're, you know, they, they don't, they might do that for a while with the phosphorus, but not, not necessarily for the long term. So um, that is one of the limitations. Now, you know, getting down to total nitrogens of one, I have done that with wetlands, but not just wetlands, right? <laughs> like right. you're usually uh, polishing after a wetlands, if, if we're going that low, you know, sand, upflow sand filters or circulating sand filters. So that's one of the, the questions that I had was just that the applicability here is that these are open systems. We've got birds, <laughs> we've got other creatures coming in. They are, they are a riot of life which also means that we can have, you know, some inadvertent, um, you know, algae blooms and this and that, which, you know, right. can contribute those measurable levels of BOD, so the biological oxygen demand, the solids, the um, phosphorus and the nitrogen can sometimes just come from plants and from algae. Right. <laughs> and and that's the, that is a core challenge of, um, you know, putting these within, you know, municipal wastewater permitting structure for NPDES because it's not... Um, you can't distinguish between whether it's a something that came from the human wastewater or something that was just generated naturally within the wetlands. So, so absolutely, Alex, I, I fully, like that's one of the, the finer points of these, particularly these very open ones, um, that, you know, they are often used as these ecological filters for um, renaturalizing the water, for handling those emerging contaminants of concern, for creating you know, a, a, um, you know, a kind of more biodiverse than just wastewater out of a pipe. One of the really unique things in the Santa Fe River that I, I think you all are aware of is not common, <laughs> is that we're discharging into a, a dry river. And so right. all, well, as you know, I mean, obviously, you know, there's all of the water in the, in the river downstream of the treatment plant is wastewater. And so the standards on that are going to be far higher than, you know, if you're going into a bigger river where you have dilution, right? Um, and so I get the challenges that, you know, exist with that. And it, it's very sensitive to try to reintroduce that water in a way that is healthy. Um, and I do think that's where wetlands would have a, an application here. But in terms of being, um, let's say, the point of compliance, <laughs> that's tricky. Um, so the Arcata system, they actually disinfect at the back end of those wetlands before they put it into the bay. So they are kind of refunneling that water. Um, we are not doing that at Fernhill because that was, uh, that these were temp those were temperature control wetlands. They were not part of the NPDES permit discharge point. So I think, you know, part of the challenge would be, you know, how, where you determine your point of compliance and, you know, how that impacts um, flow through the river. Um, so, yeah. Agreed, agreed. And, and um, we are looking at a number of different treatment alternatives and EPA is uh, proposing to enter into what they're calling a life cycle analysis study, uh, where we'll look mm -hmm. at different treatment um, technologies, the cost to the city um, and, and the customers of the city um, and, and uh, what, what environmental benefit is achieved uh, versus uh, other things like carbon footprint and energy usage, all of which is part of the carbon footprint. And whether we're mm -hmm. actually getting a benefit out of using something as stringent as, say, RO, reverse osmosis, um, mm. we may get the water quality, but we're also producing a very aggressive water to discharge back into the stream. That's not really good mm -hmm. for biota, but at the same time, it has a, a very high carbon footprint and a very high cost, obviously. Um, and then you have a waste that you have to get rid of, too. So one, one of the technologies that might be looked at is how do you incorporate like constructed wetlands into the treatment process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so at Fern Hill, what I didn't show um, is that they also have been piloting um, some big bioreactor, treatment wetland bioreactors for denitrification um, and, you know, doing a carbon feed and then using these, the gravel wetlands, they're like big media <laughs> wetlands um, for that purpose. And so I don't know if the treatment plant has a nitrification issue or a denitrification issue or where, 
that challenge exists. But there, that's why I did bring up like the Omega system and some of the ways that wetlands can be engineered um, to target specific water quality challenges. But there, it's a little different than like the kind of big sprawling pond <laughs> wetlands. Right. Uh, right. approach. There's all exactly. different ways of applying that that idea. Yep. Aaron, have you seen, uh, have you taken a tour of the wetlands or just seen the wetlands from the road below the wastewater treatment plant? Oh, on the regular. Yeah, I'm down there a lot. <laughs> I okay, love okay. that area. So, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We're actually thinking of doing a tour which will add additional uh, stops along the way just to give people a sense of, of what's going on. Um, and I want to thank you very much. We're going to move into the PFAS thing right now, but thank you, Aaron. It just sounds like we need to keep talking to you uh, and figure mm -hmm. this out and see if there's some way we can manage to use your talents and skills in biohabitats to maybe really make a difference here. Obviously, in this day and age, the funding is going to be a huge challenge, but hey, why not? I mean, so again, thank well, you so much. I hope you stay on it and I hope you'll course. continue to be part of the collaborative because um, you're a great addition and, and again, appreciative of, of all that you've contributed today. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm going to hang on the meeting and I am happy to make myself available to the Watershed Association or any of you guys who are, you yeah. know, wanting to explore this further. And, and I, I do hear you on the funding thing, but I also think this is a nature-based solution, right? That there's a ton of movement around, you know, resiliency and, you know, creating more climate resilience and more ecologically based natural nature-based solutions. So I, I think you have that potentially moving in your favor right now. With that, we're going to move Thank in. I'm going to let Matt Thank start you. this off with the PFAS research that he's done. He's recently got some information from DOD about it. So Matt, would you uh, lead this and then we'll have Alex follow you. Certainly. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I'm I got some notes that I want to read off here just so I don't uh, forget to tell you guys anything. I, I know the collaborative already got a bunch of information from the environment department. So I hope what I have here isn't too repetitive, but I just want to share what we learned after contacting the US Army offices in Washington, DC. Uh, briefly, as I'm sure you all know, there are three PFAS sites in New Mexico that the National Guard is evaluating within the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act cleanup program which we all know better is the Superfund law, the Santa Fe Aviation Support Facility, and then uh, a site in Roswell and a site in Rio Rancho. And a preliminary assessment was conducted on all three sites, uh, concluding that aqueous film forming foam, which is firefighting foam or AFFF, was either stored or suspected to have been released, making the site inspection phase necessary. Uh, the site inspection sampling has not yet been completed to confirm if a release has occurred, but the National Guard intends to coordinate site inspection sampling with the New Mexico State Environmental Regulator. So based on all of this, the Senator asked the Army a bunch of questions. Uh, is there an opportunity for public dialogue with community members? How often has, was AFFF used at these sites and in what quantities, what kind of testing is expected at these sites and how long will that take? What measures are occurring while testing is taking place? How will community members be notified of any potential exposure? what measures will be put in place if exposure is detected, and what are the additional PFAS inspection sites that you are hoping to review, the Army, that is. So we got some answers to those questions earlier this week that I just wanted to share with you. Uh, as far as a public dialogue is concerned, the Army told Senator Udall that public outreach and education are an important component of the site inspection phase, and that initial investigative efforts are expected to conclude in the next 60 to 90 days. And once the in initial investigation is complete, the Army will work with the New Mexico Environment Department to schedule additional investigative activities, if warranted, under the circumstances. Those are the Army's words. Investigations indicate that AFFF was stored at the facility in Santa Fe. An estimate of the quantity of the AFFF stored at the facility is not available right now, but no documented use of it has been identified so far. Uh, additional investigative phases are planned to test for the presence or absence of PFAS in the environment. And I think everyone's already aware of this, but testing for presence or absence of PFAS will be conducted for groundwater and soil with results expected between fiscal year 21 and 22. On um, the question of what measures the Army is taking, 
They say no measures are being taken at this time because testing has shown that there have been no exceedances of the EPA's lifetime health, ad health advisory of 70 PPT for PFAS in the drinking water at the facility itself. On um, the question of how community members will be notified of any potential exposure, the Army's initial investigation is expected to conclude in the next 60 to 90 days. And once that initial investigation is complete, they will work with the Environment Department to plan additional investigations, once again with the caveat, if warranted under the circumstances. Community outreach efforts will also begin after the initial investigation to inform the public of relevant findings and the status of planned or ongoing investigations. So again, those outreach efforts will probably happen in the next 60 to 90 days. Um, if exposure is detected, then the Army will provide an alternate drinking water supply until a more long-term solution is implemented. Those are their words and they did not give us any more detail than that. And uh, on that last question of what additional PFAS inspection sites they are hoping to review, the Army believes that there are no additional Army sites that uh, have used, stored, or disposed of AFFF or PFAS containing materials requiring investigation here in New Mexico. So the Senator was pleased to hear that AFFF wasn't used at this site in Santa Fe, or at least it hasn't been determined yet that it was used since this is the primary cause of uh, spreading contamination. But uh, he does want to stay on top of the issue and he wants our local offices here and staffers to discuss it with the Environment Department and the Governor's Office and proceed together to discuss with community leaders like the Collaborative. And we have already reached out to the Governor's Office to see how her staff and the Environment Department want to proceed. Uh, but that's as far as we have gotten. So with all of that, I hope that wasn't too long-winded or repetitive, and uh, I will do my best to answer any questions you have right now, or if I can't, I can take them uh, to our staff in Washington and, and get some answers for you. Thank you, Matt. Matt. That's great stuff. Uh, well, let's Matt, let... go ahead. Go ahead, Buzz. All right. Is that Alex? No, that was Pat. It's me. Okay, Pat, go ahead. Well, I want to make sure Alex has got to leave at 11, so I want to make sure we catch his input before he takes off. So if you're able to hang out a little longer, Pat, can we let Alex go? Sure. I just had a quick question for Matt on, okay. um, it, the, is the Army going to prepare a, what, a sampling analysis plan to sample these sites? And if they are, can we get copies of that to give input? Um, I'm assuming they will, but let me let me check on that. Okay. Hey, Alex, hit it. Yeah, and um, when I when I um, first mentioned PFAS and the fact that the um, the the training facility down near the wastewater treatment plant, actually right next to our sludge application field, is um, actually going to be doing some sampling. I didn't mean in any way that we knew there was a problem there. Just that they were going to sample at some point in time. And, and from what I've heard, it, like Matt was saying, it's going to be sometime between 2021 and 2022, 2022. So it's no time soon. They did ask us for our data. Um, we had done PFAS during what they call the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, um, level three. And we actually saw non-detect in our, in our source water s supplies. And so that was good. Um, and the reason they wanted us to do that is because they were trying to look for any background that might be coming out of like the wastewater treatment plant that we may be passing on from our source waters. But I just recently got something yesterday. We were talking to the Drinking Water Bureau and they informed us that the USGS is going to be doing sampling also uh, of surface waters and groundwaters throughout the state to determine the extent of PFAS in the state's water resources. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the samples are only going to be taken at USGS gauging stations, which I believe there's one further downstream on the Santa Fe River. So that's La good. Bajada. Yeah, at La Bajada. So we could, we could get some information there. Here again, they're looking at 2021, 2022. And they're, they're doing this in conjunction with the Environment Department. And Pat may know more about that. I actually sent him the information I had yesterday. Um, but uh, they also are contacting domestic uh, water supply systems. Um, and um, they haven't contacted us, Santa Fe, yet to ask to sample one of our wells or one of our sources. Um, but they have co contacted like Albuquerque and they're supposed to be making contact with other 
um, public water supply systems over the next three months. Um, you had mentioned to me that we have the, is it the La Cienega Mutual Domestic Water Users? Yes, they have a well that's within probably less than a half mile from the airport. I would, um, and, and if I have the person's name here and contact, and uh, I sent that to you, Carl, too. I would recommend that maybe we get in touch with her and okay. see if La Cienega can be one of the water supply systems they test. Um, Makes sense. Because, yeah, that would give us some direct information as to whether any domestic water supplies downstream are, are being affected. Um, but it's, it's positive to see that there are a number of studies going on, including the one the Army is going to be doing, but also this one by USGS. Um, my understanding, Pat, is it's under contract with the New Mexico Environment Department or somehow they're sharing resources. Um, that, that's, that's correct. So, um, so people that don't know me, I'm a groundwater aqueous geochemist and I worked at LANL for about 22 years and been with uh, the environment department for about seven and a half years and I have a master's and doctorate in aqueous geochemistry. Um, so there's a, a PFAS team with, um, within NMED and it's, it's being headed out of the Drinking Water Bureau and I'm a member of that. And the uh, U.S. Geological Survey submitted a draft proposal. Um, I gave it a pretty critical review, wanting a lot of more information, especially on the analytical labs, because it's real. You know, we're looking at parts per trillion levels, and like one part per trillion is equivalent to about one second in 33,688 years. So, so um, I want to make sure that we have the best, you know, analytical methods. Um, the cost of these analyses are about $400 per sample. And um, there's, there's a lot of PFAS chemicals. Well, you know, 5,000 to 7,000 of these compounds that are known. And these analytical labs can analyze up to maybe 35, 45 individual compounds. So I think there's a good chance that, you know, um, whoever, you know, talks to, um, Andy Yoakum in the Drinking Water Bureau that the USGS would be interested in sampling this, but I can't speak for them. And we're, we're waiting for the final work plan, which should be due pretty soon. Good information. I'm gonna get off here, but I'll try to rejoin you after this other call that I was just assigned. Um, but um, Pat, <laughs> Pat is uh, an expert on PFAS, he's been the go-to man for the environment department. So I know I'm leaving it in good hands and I'll talk to you all later. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate Bye -bye. it. Thank you, Alex. So, I mean, in all honesty, we don't know that, 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 this, that this has been used. It's only been stored as our understanding, correct? That is correct, yeah. So um, let's just keep our fingers crossed that that's okay. Um, you wanna add anything, Patrick? So yeah, so the A triple F foam, um, which is the firefighting foam, um, that's that's one of the the sources of the the PFAS. And if they've had it stored and there's no leakage, and, and during a site inspection, if there's no visual staining of the soils, because I suspect uh, where this facility is, the depth of the groundwater is what probably less than a hundred feet. Um, right you know, just get the best visual information. And if they have never used it or have never had any fire training exercises there, that would be good news, you know, that would suggest that they didn't have a release there. So, so, but, you know, it'd be nice to know the history and how much they had stored there. And again, was, is there any indication of any releases or any fire uh, training, firefighting exercises that where they may have used it. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to find out. So, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and you know, I was thinking, um, um, Aaron, with the wetlands, um, so with the PFAS, they would, uh, the wetlands would be really good. You couldn't bioremediate some of these PFAS because they just don't break down. You know, there's this really strong carbon fluorine bond. And, you know, the only way to break that down is at like temperatures of above a, like a thousand degrees Celsius. But the wetlands could really kind of sequester these PFAS. So 
you know, decrease the mobility, there wouldn't be degradation, but because of all that or solid organic carbon that's in the wetland, that would be, you know, a good remediation system to kind of keep these, you know, at least stored in a wetland structure. You have to remove them, right? Yeah, and if, if you did have to remove them, but at least, um, you know, some of the toxic forms, um, it would be unlikely that they would form in the wetlands because the wetlands are chemically and biochemically very reducing. Um, and so, so it would, it would be interesting. I've been trying to get information on what people have done for, you know, PFAS characterization in wetlands. And um, I'm sure people have looked at this. Yeah, we haven't seen anybody tackle it yet. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 And um, let's see. So, you know, getting back to the armory there, if they, National Guard, if they didn't use it, you know, that's pretty good news. But we'd want to, you know, as Matt says, you know, we'd, we would want to verify that. Absolutely. So, Pat, thank you very much. I want to move on to Mike. And can you just, Mike and Efren, just give us an update how the plant's doing? I know you guys have got challenges beyond challenges, but yeah, just give us a brief overview of what's been happening out at the, at the treatment plant. Before that, real quick, um, I was just curious on the PFAS. What about everything else that, I mean, from my understanding, it's in everyday items and all over Death the line. place. So I'm just really curious, like, or is the bigger worry just the stockpile that's sitting at the armory or is the state looking at some other, you know, maybe trying to ban things that are, you know, uh, containing it here in the state? Is there any other kind of effort on that? It, it's very challenging because there's industrial products, there's domestic products, and um, as Carl was saying, you know, any Teflon-based products, uh, you know, sunscreen, um, you know, Sharpies, uh, you know, any waterproofing materials. Um, ski wax has it. <laughs> so, so, and then, so, so say you're going out and if we happen to get a rainstorm event and you're wearing a waterproof jacket or you just use Scarch Guard and then you put it in the washer, you know, and then it goes through the system, goes through the wastewater treatment plant. There are, there are a lot of um, different um, sources, um, you know, where it can be introduced um, into the environment. And, you know, with wastewater treatment plants, you can get some of these PFAS chemicals that, um, that are called precursors, but in a wastewater treatment plant where you have a nitrification, you know, you're oxidizing the total killed all nitrogen to nitrate. So you have an, an aeration step. And then once you get that, you know, the, the nitrogen oxidized to nitrate, then you can follow that with a denitrification but there's a lot of chemistry that's going on if some of these precursor chemical, PFAS chemicals get um, oxidized. And that can generate, you know, like perfluoro, um, octanoic um, acid or PFOA, that's one of the main ones. And then perfluoro octane sulfonic acid, PFOS. And uh, so, you know, people are, you know, looking at that. And um, so, you know, people have been, you know, focusing in on, you know, wastewater treatment plants worldwide, because they are, they are a source, but, you know, what goes into those plants, you know, you really have to, common uh, household products, et cetera. That answer your question, Mike? Yes, <laughs> uh, it kind of just seems like we're, it's the dog wagging the tail, but we're not, we're not uh, going after the actual problem. We're just gotcha. trying to get rid of right. it. Right. It's just, you know, the, um, th there are just, um, Mike, just many other sources bef besides uh, aqueous film forming foam or AFFF, what you were asking. You, you, you answered your own question. Right. <laughs> it sounds like we should have people, uh, you know, sampling at the, at the wastewater treatment plant down there. Just to add another thing onto your list of things you have to take care of. Yeah. Anyway, Mike and Efren, you just give us an update how things are going out at the plant. 
So uh, last uh, Wednesday, we had uh, come out of compliance on our people count, um, but uh, we took steps trying to find and locate uh, the uh, source of, of the uh, problem. Um, it's kind of difficult to, to uh, go all at once. You have to go step by step just to, to locate where this uh, problem was originating from. So we started out at our UVs. We, we, uh, we went ahead and uh, uh, cleaned those up, uh, took off uh, as much scaling as we could, uh, any buildup that was on there. And then we started with our, uh, we moved on to our filters. Um, so if there's any tiny uh, tear on our filters, pads, um, that's enough for the uh, certain amount of solids to go through and uh, spike up on the, the fecal count. Um, we did, we did uh, find uh, several things that uh, needed to be done. We, we got, we took care of it and we're, we are currently back in compliance as of Saturday. Um, but it's kind of uh, difficult. We, we do have the aeration project that's starting off. Uh, that's going to take up uh, until next year. Um, and that should help us out with our uh, controlling our, our uh, ammonias and our nitrates, our, our nutrients, our, our uh, nitrates. So yeah, that, this, that project will be ongoing, but uh, it'll be more a phased project because it'll be, portions will be done at different times that'll just assist and make it even better uh, for removals of the nutrients as we go. So it's not gonna be like, you know, all of a sudden one day, now we got good nutrient removal. Right. Uh, so Efren, yes. does this rise to the level that we needed to, to notify downstream users? Uh, it was for, the, the notice was mainly for like the irrigators because they were, the fecal call form is what's part of the, the uh, reuse, the reuse uh, discharge uh, permits. So, if it gets high, higher than 400 uh, colony forming units, then, or well, 200 for the first one, right? 200 for the first. 200 for the class one, 400 for class two irrigators. Uh, we have to stop them from using it for the irrigation. If uh, it didn't uh, violate anything for our NPDES permits because our E. coli was still below the limits. No need to look, uh, notify the downstream users then? No, uh, not really. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again. Continue your good work. And one of the things I want to point out is after talking to Alex, we really, at our next meeting, you guys are going to be a focal point. We're going to talk about all the, all the challenges you have ahead of you in terms of deciding uh, what kind of new equipment you're going to need and, and what you're going to have to do to meet some of the new, the new discharge requirements. So that'll be the focal point for our next meeting. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Lindlein, who, is a, who has joined us. Uh, Jennifer is um, a wonderful person. Uh, she has been instrumental in uh, uh, getting a couple grants, one um, that she got for Ryan Mann that did a year-long study of the river. Uh, and now, uh, congratulations to her. She's got a four-year grant to uh, continue doing some studying. And we'd heard, we've heard rumor that some of that studying might be taking place along the lower Santa Fe watershed. With that, Jennifer, welcome and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Carl, for your kind words and thank you and Andy for including me um, in this meeting. I'm really happy to share that um, New Mexico Highlands University was recently awarded a um, $275,000 grant um, to increase student participation in and um, placement in water resources science and management careers. So the grant include, so part of the budget included um, increasing our capacity to teach water science. So we'll be acquiring um, an ion, ion spectrometer to be able to do anion, cation, and a variety of other kinds of measurements of chemical and um, physical uh, water quality parameters. In, in our laboratory. We're also going to be acquiring a number of the uh, handheld multi-parameter SONs 
that uh, users can take into the field to, to um, collect in situ a variety of those same parameters like temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and such. But a big part of this grant is for student internships. So to connect students with organizations and agencies, you know, we'll have the funding, but um, to have those relationships and have people take the students on for those mentorship um, opportunities um, where they can be engaged in and learn more about water resources science and management. So initially, um, when I was drafting the grant um, last year, I had engaged some of the local organizations like the Upper Pecos Watershed Association and the Hermit's Peak Watershed Alliance, but the Santa Fe River Traditional Communities Collaboratives and other groups are um, agencies that my students would really love to um, work with and learn from. I have a um, incoming graduate student that I see is, um, is um, tuned into the meeting, Austin Griggs. Um, he's one of the individuals that has expressed interest in continuing Ryan's study. I know that um, uh, we've been talking to some folks at the city and they're kind of wrapping their heads around whether they would want to um, continue Ryan's study exactly as it was at the same exact sites, maybe expanding upon it and, and um, identifying um, some different sites. But regardless, just having more information about um, what's happening to have a comprehensive budget, not just for that one year that Ryan looked at the Santa Fe River, but those kinds of on that kind of ongoing information um, can inform all of your conversations. Welcome, Austin. <laughs> we look forward to working with you. Ready to go. Hey. <laughs> <clears throat> Ryan, I th or Austin, I think you're on mute. All right, thank you. Um, I really appreciate being able to um, to listen in. Uh, it's great, and I'm uh, yeah excited to join the collaboration. I work at, I work at the water treatment plant in Las Vegas, so. Yeah, I have a perspective of um, the water treatment and quality here. And I'm finishing my undergrad now and about to start my master's this semester. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll ask you and Jennifer too. I mean, would it is it an affiliation with some local watershed association benefit? <laughs> yes, it's very good. Um, it, it just, it, I'm actually giving a talk at our university tomorrow about um, trying to just different kind of strategies to um, excite students about their studies and, and um, for another target area, just increasing enrollment and all of these kinds of works where students see projects that are relevant to their studies that are relative to their values. Um, are, are things that I think will attract students to Highlands and just make a um, matter better, more informed um, citizenry. So it, it's all great. It, it all ties together. And congratulations, Jennifer. It's a great benefit for, for you to get those grants. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And so like I, I had um, sent an email to um, the Hermit's Peak and the Upper Pecos Watershed Association, and I'll share with you guys. So those internships were slated to start next summer. So sometime in the winter months, I'll reach out to you and ask what your needs are. And if you have that ability to take on an intern, intern and we'll start those kind of conversations about if there's a person or a group that, that we could connect this student with and yeah, get them engaged and, and, and help your mission. I think we'll be able to find someone. Again, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else today, folks? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions. Are you hearing me? Yes. yes. No, let me unmute. We can hear you, Bobby. Now, now you're muted. Now you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. You okay. So I have a few questions. One is, this is more of a county question, I guess, but um, when I visited uh, with Dominique, uh, the, uh, the area below the wastewater treatment plant, the, um, 
the property that's, that runs along the Santa Fe River down there has a lot of trash. And there's also now access to people, people are now driving into the riverbed. Um, so what's the deal with that property there? Hmm? Where, where are you talking about, Bobby? I'm talking about the area below the wastewater treatment plant, or right next to the wastewater treatment plant. There's that property, you know, when you go over the bridge and you pass the wastewater treatment plant, and is this relevant right now, or should I be addressing something that, um, you know, for the Highlands thing here? Mike, do you know what she's talking about? People driving in there? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I want to go back to the wastewater treatment plant and to the fact that there is an enormous amount of trash down there that people are dump using it as a dumping ground. And I want to know is that the responsibility of the county? Is that somebody else that should be dealing with that? And um, so which side of Kaya Deborah it is? You're saying on the back of the treatment plant, that little road that goes back there? That's what I think you're talking about. Sorry. Um, so Michael, would right, you say I believe that's private property back there. Yeah. That's so private property. Bobby, is this when you're going down, you pass the river on the bridge and then you turn to the right immediately and head mm -hmm. that property there, correct? Yeah. Bobby, yeah. The family. yeah, so there's a lot of trash and then there's also, there's no fence protecting the river anymore. So people are now driving down in there with their vehicles. And um, so... Um, that's one thing. And then at Collier Deborah, there's a bunch of, uh, the culverts are getting clogged with debris, um, not necessarily from the beavers, but just in general, it looks like it's, you know, just stuff that's gathered there. And that's another, that's a, that's a county question. Like, does anybody go there and unclog that stuff? So, the, so if there is a, a, you know, substantial rain, which we all hope will happen, um, there's going to be flooding again there. So. Bobby, this is Maria. Um, right now, um, our maintenance staff are um, working limited hours because of the pandemic. So we are um, responding to calls, but only as they are brought up, we're being reactive, not proactive. So I appreciate you bringing that up um, to me and I will um, notify our guys and have them um, add that to their list of things to do in the next week or so. So thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Maria. Um, I, actually, I actually live right there also uh, down the road and I've noticed that the, the actual uh, bridge and right in front of the bridge on the, it would be on the, let me think here, on the west side of it, mm -hmm. that, whole, that whole area is pretty built up with uh, debris and everything. It doesn't seem like any water is really passing under the bridge anymore. So I don't know if there's some way they could reach out in there and clean that out because the, the water just tends to go back around through the culverts that are there as like a, I guess, emergency overflow type thing. So I don't know if there's some way they could get in there and actually clean that area under the bridge, but it seems the bridge is actually blocked. That's what Maria is saying. At one point, there was a beaver uh, lodge underneath there, and they right. poured six or seven uh, yards of concrete in it to, to take care of that a couple of years ago, a few years ago. So that's an ongoing concern. The other thing, the, the, the thing about the trash, I guess this is right next to the wastewater treatment plant, right, Mike? If you're going down past the treatment plant, you take a right and go down the river, people are dumping trash down there. Yeah, they're, Sounds dumping, like. they're dumping trash. I mean, I've seen mattresses and stuff thrown in there and really not even driving in anymore. They're just dumping it right there next to the bridge. That, that again, is a, it's, whether it's county or city land is the only question I have. Um, so I'm not sure. It would have to be county. I know our property ends on this side of the river. But Maria, that maybe that's another area for them to somebody to look at more an enforcement issue, right? Yeah, um, we all add that to the work order, and um, we'll do some 
reconnaissance and see what's going on. If it's an ongoing issue, we'll have to address um, fencing or access or something. The, the, that property, I believe, is county. The only property that is the, I guess, the wetland area, that one actually belongs to the airport, I believe. And the only reason that I think the city does any kind of work through that area is only on that side of the wetland because it is airport property. I'll forget that. Okay, folks, anything else today? Thank you all for coming, really appreciate it. And this is, again, I'm, I said it way too many times last meeting, but this is really one of these groups I love to get together with. It's always informative. Um, and for those people that didn't, didn't attend today, I'll do some notes within the next week or so so and get a get the highlights of some really inf interesting information. Aaron, again, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Jennifer, you too. Patrick's nice to have you aboard. And the new members from uh, the uh, Santa Fe River Commission, welcome. And I hope you got to see a little bit of what we do. We're, we're all in this to, to see what we can do to improve this river and make it a, a place that we all can be proud of. So thank you. Have a great day. And uh, let's hope this damn pandemic goes away soon. Carl, All right. uh, one, one quick thing, Carl, too, is that this, sure. we do record these and we do post them on uh, the right. Senate Watershed Association website. I'll send out the link when we get it up and post it to everyone so you can see it again. And Andy, oh. thanks again to you and the Senate right, Watershed. I do have a question for Aaron. Aaron, can you send, can you send the slide, your slide presentation to us? Yeah. I'm happy to. Okay. Thank you. And Thanks, Andy, thank everyone. you, Watershed, for hosting these um, Zoom meetings. They're, they're <laughs> thank you. Pretty interesting. Yeah. And I'm still thinking there's, I really do would like to do tours, and I want to think a little bit about how we might be able to do that in small groups to take you on tours and show you some of the really interesting little places in, in our community in, in La Cienega and La Cienega. So, anyway, uh, maybe that'll be for the next meeting. But thanks to everybody. We'll be in touch um, and appreciate you being here today. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Thank, Thank you. you.